time I went to her dorm room and just laid down. Um, and then, uh, what ended up happening was I saw the time and I went back to the classroom where I knew my mom would be waiting for me and she saw me come in the door. She was there a little early and she knew I wasn't in the class taking that test and I told her, I was like, hey, I was super sick. I'm sorry, I couldn't do it. She didn't believe me. <coughs> um, so she drug me out by my arm to the car. And on our way home, this is a very curvy Ohio country out in the middle of nowhere back to her house. She pulled off onto a different road and she told me that she was taking me to this school for troubled girls. And I knew this was coming because I had found the paperwork in our home before I left my our home. I knew this was a goal of theirs. Um, so I wasn't surprised at all. But I was like, Let's, I'm not going. Like, I'm not going to this, you know, place. I, I refuse to go. Like, this is my child. Um, I have the right to keep it if I want to. It's not your decision. Um, and when she was like, no, you're wrong. It's your dad and I's decision. We will decide what's best for you. And I was freaking, you know, of course, I was crying and freaking out. And she's like, that's it. I can't take any more of you. She's like, I'm calling your dad. He can meet us here. So she pulls over the car on this back country road. And I uh, decide to make the very bold move to jump out of the car. And I knew it was my only chance. It was my only chance of making it. And I was very fit at the time. And um, I... My mom, of course, grabbed onto me, and she left these deep nail scratches all the way down my arm, and she pulled my hair out, and um, I ran. I ran as fast as I possibly could into the middle of the forest, and I kept running, and I kept running, and I kept running, and then finally I came to a creek. I walked through the creek a little bit because I had, I knew, I knew my mother would call someone, most likely to come find me because she couldn't do it herself. And I was smart enough to know if I walked through water, they couldn't track me. So I walked down this creek for a little while. And then I climbed up into a tree. I was all 14 weeks pregnant at the time. I climbed up into this tree and I sat there. And I, um, I just cried. I cried out to Jesus. And I was just like, Jesus, you have to do this for me. And I knew there was probably no way I would have service out in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of woods, in the middle of a valley, nonetheless, with a creek. Um, you know, an old, crappy cell phone service. So, I, uh, I opened my backpack and pulled the cell phone out. And I held it up, and I had four bars of service, and I just cried, because I knew, I knew that normally I wouldn't have found any service out there, um, <coughs> and I called my social worker in tears, and I told her what had happened, and I told her what road I was off of, and she told me, she said, don't move, I'm coming for you, um, and she's like, call your grandma and let her know what's going on. So I called her, and I let her know where I was, what was going on. And then I called my now husband, and I, I let him know where I was and what was going on. And sure enough, um, probably 20 minutes later, here come the dogs. They, uh, My mom had called me in as a runaway. And... Um, I guess in some ways I was. I wasn't actively running, but I was sitting up in a tree just praying for a miracle. And um, so they came. I watched them for a little while just because I thought it was funny they couldn't find me. I was smart enough to walk down that creek. <clears throat> I don't think they would have ever found me if I wouldn't have called out. Um, so Because I, I was way up high in a tree. And finally I called out and I, I said, hey, I'm up here. I'm not going to run. I 
no intention of running from you. And so I slowly got down and I grabbed my backpack. And of course, they put my hands behind my back. They handcuffed me. Treated me like I was a terrible criminal. And I looked up at the guy and I, I told him, I was like, listen, it's not what you think. Like, there is an open CPS case against my family. This is not what you think. And uh, I was like, I'm pregnant. And he just, like, rolled his eyes and he was like, whatever, you're a runaway, you know. And he treated me horribly. And um, he was just, like, pushing me, shoving me, pulling, you know, through the briars and all this different stuff. And then he got me to the side of the road, and he's, like, patting me down. Like, I'm, like, a legit criminal. I'm, like, a 17-year-old scared pregnant girl. Like, I have nothing. I mean, I guess I know they deal with horrible situations, but I think anyone could have looked at me and known that I was not a threat at any, in any way, shape, or form. So, um, they put me in, uh, the back of the car, and at that very moment, my CPS worker showed up, um, I remember she was in a Mustang, and it seemed like, like, the chariot of horses had come for me, like, you know, the Mustang, little, <laughs> so it, it felt like God just intervened in so many ways, and she showed up right as they were putting me in, <coughs> and she told him, like, hey, this is not what it seems, there is an open CBS case, and she looked me over real quick, and she saw I had these marks all over me from my mom, and she goes, uh, we're not taking, she looked at him, he's, she's like, I have authority here, because there's already an open case, we're not taking her to juvie, we're taking her to the hospital, she's pregnant, so they took me to the hospital, and, um, they did a psychological evaluation on me, and guess what? It turns out I was normal. They did one on my parents, and it turns out they were crazy. Um, and my grandparents were called into a room, and they were told by the psychologist that, well, there's nothing wrong with that girl, but there's certainly something wrong with her parents. Um, so I'm writing an order for her to be placed with you. So I was placed with them. And there was a custody battle. It was really, really bad. Essentially, what ended up happening is my parents signed me over so that they wouldn't lose their other children. Which, in some ways, I wish... <clears throat> I wish I would have pushed more to have them removed as well because they're a mess, to be completely honest. I, I see a lot of damage that could have been prevented. Especially, you know... Especially my youngest sister. So, uh, <coughs> so that is kind of the first bit of my story, um, and how pregnancy found me at a very, very early age. Um, so, I'm gonna try to get back with you in a few days. I'll tell you about my first pregnancy. My first birth story and my first postpartum and how that really changed and affected me to become involved in um, women's true feminism and um, women's you know health and wellness and spiritual vitality and understanding that the brokenness of our mothers really do affect us and the brokenness of our motherhood you know and how we became Mothers really affects our children. All right, so this is longer than I want it to, but that's that's the first little bit of my story, and I will try to uh, condense what happens next in the next one. All right, I will talk to you all later. I'm going to end this with a Hail Mary because I think that you, you just can never love Mary more than Jesus did, so I'm going to end it with that. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right.
Uh, have a great day, and I will come back with part two of my story. I'll see you later. Bye.